Let's switch gears a bit and just forget about crypto for a minute and let's consider something completely unrelated or at least seemingly unrelated. Um, let's think about a scenario where um, somebody wants to make a list of, it, of anything. Let's say it's pictures of cats, okay? Uh, so someone wants to have the ultimate you know, set of, of cat pictures. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to try and get um, a group of people uh, to decide what goes on the list and what doesn't go on the list. Okay, so we have uh, a bunch of different people. They might be all over the world and they're connected to each other somehow. Uh, so we usually call this a peer-to-peer -peer network. Okay, so we have a P2P network. And the idea here is that anybody who has a picture of a cat uh, can kind of broadcast it to whoever they know in the, in the um, network, and it can also uh, filter around the network as well. And so you end up with this kind of like pool of pictures that are kind of floating around the network. And the network itself, they're going to turn this pool of, of pictures into an actual uh, set of pictures. Okay, so this is kind of like the final set. Okay, and so um, there's a couple of things that you have to consider, but let's consider this one sort of core problem. And that is that for some reason, somebody thinks it's really funny to, pitch, to submit pictures of dogs instead of cats. So you have this pool of pictures and anyone can submit a, a picture of a cat, but there's a bunch of people who, for whatever reason, they're submitting pictures of dogs. And so what the peer-to-peer -peer network is going to do is it's going to serve as a kind of filter, okay? So you have a pool of pictures, some of them are cats, some of them are dogs. Um, but when the peer-to-peer -peer network kind of cleans up the set of pictures or the pool of pictures, uh, we're only going to have a list of cats that are left, okay? Um, so what's the network doing uh, in between? They're, they're kind of, we can kind of break down what they're doing in three steps. Um, so they're selecting a picture. They're agreeing on its validity. So in this case, that it actually is a cat and not a dog. Okay, and then it includes it on the list. And then uh, it just repeats. Okay, so it sits there all day and it goes through these four steps. Okay, so someone selects a picture, then they all kind of agree, okay, this is actually a cat, or maybe someone picks a dog and they all agree that this is a dog and it shouldn't be included in the list. Uh, so it includes it on the list if valid. and then they repeat, okay? So they just sit here doing these four steps over and over and over again. All right, so Bitcoin's blockchain, it turns out will work kind of similar to this. And uh, right now, because we haven't gotten there yet, we're not gonna focus in on how all of these steps happen, but let's just look at one of these steps. Um, okay, so let's just say that for somehow, like who is it that selects it and what if two people select a picture at once and put it up for a vote? Uh, we're not sure, we're not sure about all of those scenarios. So we'll forget about how a picture selected, but we'll assume that for one reason, for some reason somehow we decided that one node uh, was allowed to pick a picture out of the pool. And now we're gonna all agree on its validity, okay? And then somehow it's gonna get put in a list and how's that list gonna be broadcast and all of those questions we're just gonna totally leave aside, okay? We're just gonna consider um, a, a more basic question um, so, so we can sort of simplify this question where you have n nodes um, who are agreeing on whether something is valid or invalid. Okay, so a very simple binary question 
and all the nodes are going to agree. And once they reach agreement, then we'll, we'll do something in response uh, to that agreement that, that we're just sort of leaving aside for now. Okay. So this is the question. So the question is, how would you, if you had to write an algorithm for how this peer-to-peer -peer network's going to agree on things, given the fact that maybe nodes are gonna think different things. Some of them will think that it is a cat. Some of them might think it's not a cat. Some of them might be malicious. Um, you know, so, so what's the protocol that you're gonna use to, to put out this agreement? And so initially it should strike you as kind of maybe silly that we're, we're talking about an algorithm for doing this because the solution is so obvious. So let's start with the obvious solution, which is let's just have a vote, okay? We have n nodes and uh, everyone just says valid or they say invalid. And if the majority says it's valid, then we, we consider it agreed that it's valid. And if the majority says it's invalid, we say uh, it's invalid, okay? Um, so, so that's a very simple uh, procedure and it, it does actually work in a lot of uh, scenarios, but we'll, we'll think of some corner cases where it's not gonna work for us. Okay, so our agreement protocol can be uh, to vote. Uh, let me be a little more precise. So let's say uh, to have each node vote. And uh, take the majority. Now, why do we take the majority? Why don't we say everyone votes and we need 100% valid or 100% invalid? Well, if there's any disagreement, then we could end up sort of in between where we don't actually have a clean decision, right? Um, let's say 99 nodes, if there's 100 nodes, they say it's valid. There's one node that says it's invalid. Uh, so, so what do you decide if, if your threshold, or you could have a default, so it's invalid unless if 100% of them say it's valid, then we'll consider it valid. Um, so there's different ways you could set it up. Usually we use a majority uh, because we're gonna tolerate some level of uh, mistakes, errors, um, or in this literature, they're usually called faults. Um, so there's a really fancy name for where we're going called Byzantine fault tolerance. So this idea of fault tolerance is that uh, some, some people make faults. Um, or uh, the other thing is that sometimes, you know, a fault to me means it's just a mistake and there was no intention behind it. It just happened to be a mistake. Uh, but sometimes people are lying, right? There's an intention there, right? So they're, they're they actually know that this is valid, but they want to convince you it's invalid or vice versa. Okay, so there's a malicious intent. Okay, um, so we can tolerate uh, some level of, um, of faults or errors or uh, malicious behavior. Okay, and because there's different people in history who have been considered by other people in history to be malicious. Uh, the name for, for nodes that are malicious, it end, underwent a, a bunch of name changes, um, but everyone, uh, or at least the, the academics, agreed that this, there was this empire, the Byzantine Empire, and they were kind of malicious. And so uh, we'll, we'll call bad nodes Byzantine nodes. Okay, so a Byzantine node is, is uh, a malicious node. So basically what we're saying is uh, if something's Byzantine fault tolerant, it tolerates some level of both malicious nodes and faulty nodes. And malicious nodes are, uh, they can do everything a faulty node can do and they can do a little bit more. Um, so they can deliberately try and do the exact wrong thing that will have maximum impact over the vote itself. Uh, so we'll, we'll get there in a second uh, for, for what you can do. Right now, the only bad thing you can do is basically vote wrong, okay? Um, so in this in this base case, or at least the way that you're probably thinking about it, um, uh, the worst behavior is to vote wrong. Now, if the worst behavior is to vote wrong, what you're really doing is you're probably making a, a kind of implicit assumption. 
which is that when you report your vote, so let's say that, let's go back to our little diagram here and let's say that uh, the node that's voting uh, happens to be this node here. Uh, so they vote valid, they vote invalid, but they have to communicate that vote to all the other nodes, okay? The other nodes have to learn how this uh, node actually voted, okay? And notice that we said, oh, you just take the majority. Well, we didn't specify who's taking the majority, right? It's, it's not like there's some central party here that's tallying up all the votes, that's going to everybody and asking how they voted, right? All you can do is you can ask all your peers how they voted. You can come to a, a conclusion about whether the people you know about are sort of majority in favor or majority not in favor, but everybody will have a slightly different view of the network and they might have slightly different tallies, okay? Um, so, so this idea that uh, when you report your vote and um, everybody on the network hears that vote, um, that's an assumption that you made uh, that's maybe not necessarily true and is probably not actually true in a peer-to-peer -peer network, okay? So the implicit assumption that we made, uh, we call it a broadcast channel. So a broadcast channel means that um, when one entity uh, votes, uh, everyone else hears about it, okay? So uh, when a node votes, everyone hears, okay? But there is no broadcast channel in a peer-to-peer -peer network, okay? They don't have, there's, there's no mechanism for a broadcast channel necessarily, okay? Um, and so we can't actually make that assumption, okay? So in theory, maybe on paper we can make that assumption, but in practice that's not a, a actual valid assumption, okay? So if we can't make that assumption, then what, what assumptions can we make? Um, so one thing we might assume that's, that's a little weaker is we might assume instead, so an alternative assumption, is that you have what's called a fully connected network. And that means that every node in your network is connected to every other node. So as drawn here, this is not a fully connected network, but we could add a bunch of uh, edges to this network and, and make it fully connected, okay? So then, um, at least if you're voting valid, you can tell everybody else about how, how you voted, okay? So uh, it seems that in this case, the worst that you can do is still just to vote wrong, okay? But there is one other thing that you can do, and the benefits of doing it isn't perfectly obvious. And uh, this is a good point to maybe pause and say that I'm not trying to, like Byzantine fault tolerance is this very big field. It's been studied for decades. Um, I'm really here to give you the intuition or sort of the flavor uh, for what it is and not get into the nitty gritties. And we won't actually look at any BFT protocols uh, for this course, but I'm, I'm just trying to highlight what the issues are. Um, but anyways, one thing that you can do is if you're fully connected, you can tell different people in the network different things. So let's say that you're voting invalid, but um, maybe there's a few nodes that you, you tell that you are voting valid. Like maybe um, everybody knows this thing is valid and you want it to be ruled invalid, but you're afraid of getting caught. And so there's certain people that you will vote kind of with the majority and you'll say that it's uh, valid even though it's not. Uh, and then for other people, you'll you'll sort of reveal your true intention, which is to consider this invalid, okay? So um, in a full assumption, or sorry, in a fully connected network, um, you, can, uh, you can still vote wrong. That's one, a malicious node can vote wrong. And a malicious vote can also do what we call equivocate, which is um, tell different nodes different votes. Okay, and it's, it's maybe not immediately clear why this is beneficial or, or how you can, you can game it. And that's because this becomes a problem when the protocols become a little bit more complicated. And the reason they get uh, a little more complicated is because often you don't have even a fully connected network. That's often uh, too strong of an assumption, okay? 
So let's, let's put down a third assumption, which we'll call a realistic assumption, uh, which is going to be a partially connected network. Okay, and in a partially connected network, um, malicious nodes can still do the same kinds of things that they can do in either a fully connected or a broadcast channel. So they can still vote wrong. Okay, um, they can still equivocate. Notice in the broadcast channel, they can't. So in a broadcast channel, the assumption is that whatever you broadcast, everyone receives. Okay, so. You, if you vote valid, everybody here is valid. And if you vote invalid, everyone here is invalid. A fully connected network is almost a broadcast channel, except for you could tell different people different things. Okay, so you could equivocate. So that's an extra attack that you're able to do. Now, when we have a partially connected network, uh, you can vote wrong and you can equivocate in terms of your own vote. But the other thing is, if it's partially connected, what that means is you can't directly collect votes from all the nodes because you're not connected to every node. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to rely on the other nodes to relay votes to you, right? So if the purple uh, node here wants to know how the, um, let's say the green node voted, okay, uh, what they're going to do is they're going to have to ask this node, hey, how did the green vote note vote? Okay, and if this node is malicious, they can lie about their own vote, right? But they can also lie about how the green node voted. Okay, so they can relay the information wrong. Now, in this case, the purple may say, um, well, the purple here is, is kind of in trouble because this is the only node that they're connected to, right? Um, but let's say that the uh, node here has a, a separate connection. Let's say they're also connected to this node. Then maybe they ask this node about the green node and how the green node voted and maybe they get a different response. So this node is telling them that the green vote node voted valid, and this node is telling them that the green vote node voted invalid, okay? Um, and notice they can't make a decision, right? One of these could be right or one of them could be wrong, but the point is if, if they can get enough kind of partial paths, uh, or if they can get along the path of enough nodes to this particular node, then they could take kind of like a little majority vote a mini majority vote just about whether this node actually voted valid or invalid, okay? And so you have to sort of do that. You have to kind of piece together how people voted because malicious nodes are going to relay uh, relay uh, votes wrong as well, okay? So they can also uh, relay the wrong vote for the nodes that they're connected to. Okay, so this is going to be problematic because now not only can you vote wrong, but you can vote wrong on behalf of all the people that you're connected to, okay? And then the final thing is the purple node is trying to figure out uh, how the green node voted, and they're doing that by asking this node, right? Because this node is connected to the green node. Well, it's obvious to us because we're seeing this whole picture that this node's connected to the green node, but how is it that the purple node even learned that this node is connected to the green node, right? And so if the purple node is only learning that because they asked, right? And if this node's malicious, then this node can additionally lie about who they're connected to. Maybe this node actually isn't connected to the green node, right? And uh, they're, they're just gonna lie about it. They're going to say, oh yeah, the green node, yeah, I'm connected to the green node, and by the way, the green node is voting invalid, right? Um, so, so nodes can also lie about uh, who they're connected to, and they can make it seem like they're connected to way more nodes than they actually are. Okay, so as you can see, a, a malicious node has a lot more power than just voting wrong. When you have these realistic assumptions, like you have a partially connected network, then um, you, you have all this extra concerns. You have to consider a whole, a whole range, a whole spectrum of malicious behaviors, behaviors that a malicious node might do. 
And your protocol is going to have to be resilient to, to all of these attacks, okay? Um, and so it ends up actually being a much trickier proposition. You can't just say, you know, tell me how you vote, tell me everyone you're connected to, and tell me how everyone you're connected to votes, okay? What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to ask different people for the same piece of information to see uh, if you're getting different pieces of information from different people, and you're going to have to ask, you know, and, and so it ends up being a, a very complicated protocol uh, where there's lots and lots of rounds of communication, even for a simple decision like here's one picture, is it a cat or is it a dog? So the study of all of these protocols are called uh, Byzantine Fault Tolerant Protocols. So a BFT protocol is one that solves this particular issue. So it's resilient. So it will make the correct decision uh, even if there's malicious nodes that are doing all of these attacks. Now you might say, well, what if all the nodes are malicious? How, how on earth is a protocol going to work in that case? And the answer is it can't, okay? So there are there is some bound to uh, how malicious the network can be, and usually it's given very explicitly, okay? So this happens within uh, a certain bound or number of malicious nodes. Okay, and it turns out that this bound depends on a bunch of assumptions. So this is only one cut through a bunch of assumptions you can make. There's there's a whole bunch of other assumptions you can make uh, or not make uh, that that are alternate between kind of theoretical and realistic. But you know, for a broadcast channel, you can do a lot better than if you have a partially connected network. Okay, um, so most Byzantine fault tolerant protocols, uh, you need. Um, uh, so, so a typical assumption for, for a realistic network is something like uh, no more than a quarter nodes are, are malicious. And sometimes you see other expressions. So it might be no more than a third. Uh, so that's also common. And if you give very, very generous assumptions, you might get it to where you can actually tolerate half of your network uh, being malicious. But usually once once you're over a half, uh, then the majority is malicious and there's, there's not much you can do against a, a malicious majority, okay? Uh, when you have a malicious ma majority, uh, sometimes we call that a 51% attack. So you have 50% of the network plus one. Um, and that's a, a concept that we're going to circle back to uh, when, we, when we talk about Bitcoin. Okay, so I'm not going to show you how BFT protocols work. They're, they're kind of complicated and, and there's a whole bunch of different assumptions. So one protocol works in one set of assumptions. Um, but I just want to kind of motivate the idea that the seemingly simple protocol that's just filtering cat pictures from dog pictures across a peer-to-peer -peer network actually ends up being a lot harder uh, than, than maybe you initially thought, okay? Now, there's one other complexity uh, when, when we're talking about voting. Um, okay, so I'll put additional complexity. Actually, I'll put additional implicit assumption. Uh, so we made this one implicit assumption, which is that we had a broadcast channel, but it turns out we don't really have a broadcast channel. Okay, there's another assumption that we're making just because it, it's so easy to make that you don't really stop and think about the fact that you're making this assumption, but that is we're taking a, a vote across one, two, three, four, five, six, seven nodes, okay? Um, how did we know that there's seven nodes, right? Like, like who told us that there were seven nodes on this network? You're, you're looking at the picture so you can see it, but how does this purple node determine that it's talking to six other nodes? And in particular, let's say this, this green node's malicious, uh, what it could do is it could pretend to be 100 nodes or 1,000 nodes, right? And so when you connect to it, it will be like, here, let me introduce you to all my friends. All of its friends are, its act, it's just itself, right? Uh, maybe you're looking at IP addresses because this is explicitly a network, but that's easy. I mean, you can allocate yourself a big chunk of IP addresses. And so how do you know that you're actually getting one vote per node or put it a different way, what defines a node? When is a node one node as opposed to 100 nodes as opposed to 1,000 nodes, okay? So uh, additional implicit assumption is that you, um, you, you know the number of nodes.
in order to vote. So the voting system is set up as one vote per node, okay? But if I can make my node look like a thousand nodes, then I get a thousand votes because I have a thousand nodes and then I can overwhelm uh, the vote. Okay, so we need some mechanism. And this is solved usually one of two ways. Um, so one way is that you actually know the nodes, like you personally know them. Or this is a network of between a bunch of companies, like there's 10 companies that are involved and you know those 10 companies. And so, um, uh, and so, so you give one node or one vote to each company, okay? Um, Right, so, so, and we sometimes call this a closed network. Uh, later when we, we talk about blockchain, this is sometimes we call what we call a permissioned blockchain or a private blockchain or a consortium blockchain. There's subtle differences between those three in, in terms of how they're used, but it's sort of this notion that you have a closed network uh, so you know who the nodes are. Okay. Uh, but in an open network, you have this big problem. So an open network is a network where you're running it, like for example, over the internet, and anyone in the world can join or leave the network at any time. Okay, so how do you stop a node from becoming, you know, looking like a thousand nodes? So Bitcoin has a, actually a very, very clever solution to this. Uh, what I'm not going to show you yet is Bitcoin's solution to it. But what I'm going to show you is a solution that, that predates Bitcoin that, that kind of is, it's sort of scratching at the same uh, surface in terms of, of ideas. Um, so let's think of, um, well, first off, this idea of creating fake nodes uh, or fake identities it's sometimes called uh, a civil attack. And it's not just in terms of these networks, peer-to-peer -peer networks trying to decide things. That's, that's one context in which they emerge, but it emerges in all sorts of contexts. Like if you're on social media, let's say you're on Twitter, uh, someone might make a bunch of fake accounts and then they might you know, follow one account. You can actually pay, like if you want 5,000 followers, you can pay a certain amount of money. It's not that expensive, like $100 and you'll get 500 or 5,000 followers. Uh, but they're all like fake accounts, right? Because anybody can make an account. I could make a thousand accounts. Uh, I could write a little automated script that, that would make that fairly easy. Um, you know, Twitter will fight back and they'll make you have a unique email address or the, they'll do different tricks to try and, and limit the creation of these fake accounts. But you can make fake accounts and you can have them all vote, like upvote or retweet like a given tweet or stuff like that. So this idea of kind of fake identities is, is more broad uh, than this particular context, okay? Um, but what some people had is they had this idea of um, what we really wanted to, uh, so to combat this, is uh, what we need to do is we need to slow down how long it takes to create an account, okay? Or rate limit. So we're gonna rate limit uh, the creation of new accounts. And what can we use from all the stuff that we looked at? We spent a long time looking at different crypto primitives. Is there anything that's kind of like a rate limiter? And so it is actually, it's the most recent thing that we talked about, which is the proof of work. Okay, so what you could do is in order to, to sort of combat fake identities is you could say, okay, anybody can come and join our network, but before they join, they have to solve a proof of work. Okay, so you need a solution uh, to 
a proof of work problem or puzzle to join the network. So this is actually a pretty nice uh, kind of solution. Um, so the original paper that talked about these attacks, they had this kind of as a solution. Um, it's still kind of problematic because the number of identities that a malicious actor will create. Uh, so basically someone will come along, they're a legitimate user, they'll solve one puzzle and then they'll join the network and someone else is going to come and they want to overwhelm the vote. And it's true, this proof of work is going to stop them from creating, say, a million accounts, but it's not going to stop them from creating 10 or 100, right? It's going to slow them down a bit, but they'll still create more accounts than a legitimate user, okay? Um, and so uh, there was a, a sort of tweak uh, to this, this protocol where they said, um, what will happen is you'll, when you join the network, you will basically everyone, malicious or not malicious, will solve as many puzzles as they can. And maybe you, you run kind of like little bursts. So like every, every hour you're like, okay, everyone, let's solve as many puzzles. You have one minute to solve as many puzzles as you can. So all the good nodes on the network and all the malicious nodes on the network will solve as many puzzles as they can uh, in that one minute period. And then what you do is you hand out ballots, you know, to vote based on the number of puzzles you solve. So if you solve a hundred puzzles, then you get a hundred votes. And if you solve a thousand, you get a thousand. Okay. Uh, so they'll solve as many puzzles as they can, and then they get one vote per solution. Okay. And so what we've done is we've sort of subtly shifted the question of one vote or this the the criteria for for whether you're allowed to vote or not we've shifted the criteria from one vote per node to one vote per amount of computational work you can do and this is a key observation because now if i'm one computer and i want to make you believe that i'm a thousand computers i'll actually have to run a thousand times faster than if i was a single computer and I can't do that, okay? I can create a thousand IPs, that's easy, but running a thousand times faster, I can't do. And in fact, the only way I can really do it is go out and buy a thousand computers, but now I'm actually legitimately a thousand nodes, right? It, it's not some fakery or trickery where I'm tricking you into thinking I'm a thousand, I'm actually legitimately a thousand nodes as well, okay? Um, and so what the result of this is you get sort of one vote per, we'll call it computational unit, meaning, um, you know, puzzle that you can solve, computational puzzle you can solve. Unit of computation or unit of work, okay? Um, and so this is a trick that, that Bitcoin will also use. They'll, they'll use it in a very different way. So it's it's not going to be handing out puzzles and everyone tries to solve it as, as, as many puzzles as they can. Uh, it kind of looks the same at first glance, but the way Bitcoin uses it is, is actually very, very clever. Uh, it's a lot more clever uh, than this particular protocol. But this, this idea of, you know, um, this idea here, this was published, you know, before Bitcoin and, and Bitcoin does exploit essentially the same principle.